Uh, no, wait, hold on. Let's change the background. Let's change the text font. <laughs> I had meant to type out the word you, but this works too, I guess. <laughs> So I'm using Google Slides today because I have a new kind of video lined up. We're going to be solving a puzzle today. However, this is a puzzle that I created. While the biggest goal of this channel has always been to document how I solve puzzle hunt puzzles, in part so that I can get better at solving puzzle hunt style puzzles, but also so that I can hopefully show some other people how one goes about solving this style of puzzle. But in addition to puzzle solving, one thing that I've wanted to focus on on this channel for a while is aspects of puzzle creation. And a big part of the reason for that is that I feel like I still have a lot to learn in terms of puzzle creation. I talk a lot in my puzzle solving videos about the things that I feel the creators of those puzzles did very well, but today we're going over a puzzle that I created, so I feel like I have the complete right to criticize and heavily analyze this puzzle to the maximum extent. So without further introduction, here is the puzzle. It's called The Bat's Domain, and I'll leave a link down in the description if you would like a printable PDF version of this or a JPEG version of this puzzle for you to work out yourself. The flavor text reads, of all the animals in the jungle, none are so astute as the mighty bat. While the other animals play, crash into each other, and swing upside down from the trees, the bat blindly tracks their position. And then we have a grid of cells that either are blank or have an X in them. And we have a number of animals written around the exterior of the grid. At the bottom of the grid, there's a big question mark. So if you would like to attempt to solve this puzzle yourself before I dive into the solution of it, you should pause the video now because I'm gonna start talking about the solution in three, two, one. Here we go. My big hope for the beginning of this puzzle was that people would notice the word blindly in the flavor text. And in particular, seasoned puzzle hunters tend to know that whenever something about blindness or feeling or bumps are referenced in the flavor text, that typically is an indicator of braille coming into play somewhere in the puzzle. So that might give us an idea of how to interpret this grid of X's as well as blank spaces. The X's could be the dots of the braille and the blank spaces could be the places where there isn't a dot in the braille. And then we have the matter of these animals around the outside of the grid. And we're also told that the bat is tracking the positions of the animals. So from these clues, the intent is that the solver will realize that they need to convert these animals into braille and then find them in the grid, like a word search. I've started by translating the word meerkat into braille because it's one of the longer words that we have and this double letter E could potentially help us to track down the word in the grid. And in fact, braille characters in general tend to use the bottom row of dots less often than the top two rows of dots. So one potential way that we can break into finding words in this puzzle is to look at where we have long strands of blank spaces. For the word meerkat, there's going to be a blank space in the bottom row of the M, followed by four blank spaces along the bottom rows of the two E's. So we know that we need to find a row of five blank spaces with two X's on either side. I see that there's five blank spaces right here where I've put this red box. Uh, however, we don't uh, have the letters for meerkat around those five blank spaces. There's also five blank spaces down here, but again, there's not quite the letters that we need for meerkat. And finally, after enough searching, we find this row of five blank spaces with two X's on either side. And we see first here is the character for M, and then we have these two downward sloping lines for E's. Over here is the character for R, it's a T that's on its side. And then we have the two dots for the K, a single dot for an A, and this Tetris-like piece is a T here. So the word meerkat is spelled running through these cells. So I've put a somewhat transparent box around the word meerkat in the grid, and now that the solver has confirmed that they can in fact find these words written in braille within the grid, we can start trying to find the rest of the words as well. The word amoeba can be found right here. The word alpaca can be found immediately next to it. You'll notice that that A gets used twice, once at the end of amoeba and once at the beginning of alpaca. So kind of like in a normal word search, how we can use letters multiple times, we notice that that might be happening here. And then lastly, the word lizard can be found immediately below amoeba and alpaca. 
So now that we've found all of the animals that are written along the bottom of the grid, we should turn our attention to trying to find some of these other animals that are written along the edges. But it may strike the solver as strange that these words are written in the wrong direction. Uh, if we're meant to read these words by just looking at the page as it's presented, these words are a bit difficult to read, as well as these words at the top of the grid that are completely upside down. The solver may spend some time trying to find these animals in the grid as it is, and they'll find that they're unable to. And so the goal is that the solver will realize that unlike our Latin alphabet, which has a standard orientation, you can only really read it in one direction, in a braille grid that's presented in this particular way, we could continue to find braille words if we rotated the grid. Here I've rotated the grid in all of our work so far 90 degrees to the side, and now these words that were originally written along the edge of the grid can be read in a normal way. So now the solver can try to find these words within the grid in the same way that they did for the animals that were written along the bottom. For example, the word kitten has four dots along the middle row with spaces that don't have a dot on the right and on the left. So we need to just look through the grid for sections like this where there's four X's in a row in two blank spaces on the sides. Along this set of four X's up here at the top of the grid, uh, which used to be the right of the grid, we see that the word kitten is spelled inside of that blue box there. After finding the word kitten, we can find the word marmot written across the bottom of the grid here. And then the words pig and emu are actually written right beside each other over here on the right hand side of the grid. So now we found all the words on this side of the grid, we can again rotate and try to find some words on the other sides. Unlike the other sides of the grid, there are five animals written along the top part of the grid here. The word roundworm is particularly long and it's written right here along what is now the bottom of the grid. We find that the word hippo is written up here. And then primate, grizzly, and snake are all written in here in this middle section of the grid. Primate is up here along the top, snake is here along the bottom, and grizzly is written right here. We'll notice that some of the dots from the word grizzly are actually also used in one of the words that we read along the side of the grid. So now we just have one more side of the grid to go. At this point, it's probably easier to find new words by focusing on some of these large spaces of unused dots and blank spots. For example, the word hamster is written in here with a bunch of these unused letters. The word skunk is written up here, and again, we're reusing a number of characters from both the red and the yellow sections. We have the word rodent written right here in the grid. And the last word that we need to find is dog, which can be found right here. So we've now found all of our words in the grid and we have something that looks kind of like this. Now again, it's my hope that solvers would be able to do this on paper because I found highlighting everything in the grid with various colors of highlighters to be pretty satisfying myself. Um, but I don't think it was actually too challenging to do it here in Google Slides. This is definitely the kind of puzzle that would have been a bit more difficult to do in Google Sheets, which is where puzzle hunts are typically done. So now that we have everything filled into the grid, we can ask ourselves, what do we do to get the final answer? The question mark is written at the bottom of the page, and so let's rotate the page back to its original shape so that we see the question mark uh, in its normal orientation. And when we look at the finished grid, a solver might think about the these places where the words have overlapped. However, they sometimes make weird and interesting shapes and it doesn't seem to give us anything. However, there are several places in the grid where the letters weren't used and those seem to make a nice two by three section that we could read as braille. In fact, if we treat every three rows of the grid as one row of braille characters, there's exactly one braille character in every row from the top of the grid down to the bottom. Reading these braille characters off from top to bottom, we get the letters A, D, A, M, W, E, S, T, which gives the final answer to this puzzle, Adam West. Adam West is of course an actor who among other things is very well known for playing the character of Batman in the 1960s TV show, Batman, which I think makes it a pretty apt answer for this bat-themed puzzle. 
So now I want to get a little critical of this puzzle. I want to talk about the things that I like about it. I want to talk about the things that I don't like about it. The idea for this puzzle originated from a conversation that I had with a friend a few years ago. We were talking about puzzles that could be particularly nasty to solve. And the idea of a braille word search came up because it just sounds like the kind of puzzle that's going to not have any great way of solving it. It almost sounds like you just need to go row by row and see if the uh, braille words ever actually show up anywhere. A while later, I was working on a puzzle hunt that I've since completely scrapped, and I can talk about why I scrapped that puzzle hunt in a later video. But one of the answers was Adam West, and I knew that Adam West was a very famous actor for playing Batman, and given that old adage is blind as a bat, I thought, what better answer to encode in a braille word search than Adam West. I started to encode some words into a grid, and it was around then that I realized that it might not actually be as evil to expect a solver to find a braille word in a grid as I had initially thought. The reason for that being that when you string these braille letters together, you often get sometimes very large strands of either dots or of blank spaces. Like over here at the end of Alpaca, there was this seven by two box of just dotless boxes. There, there can't be that many places, even in a fairly large grid like this, that that particular pattern is going to show up. So while I recognized that not every solver was probably going to realize that there were going to be these uh, easily searchable patterns that they could find within the grid, I decided to move forward with the idea of creating the braille crossword anyway. The idea to rotate the grid and start putting some of the entries running vertically and upside down came as a result of that. And so this puzzle is the end result of that effort to create a braille word search. I do like this mechanic of rotating the grid, and I think that putting the words running along the outside of the grid in the direction that you have to uh, read the braille, I, I think that that's a pretty strong clue for rotating the grid, and it's my hope that most solvers will understand that. I was happy that I was able to overlap the words in several places, but I do know that I have several places in the grid, like down here where I just kind of put the words pig and emu on top of each other. There were just some places where I couldn't quite figure out how to overlap letters in an interesting way and just kind of had to put standard words in there um, just to cover the spot. I think if I were designing this again, I would spend a little bit more time trying to overlap the words in more interesting ways. As it is, I just I don't think it's very interesting that there's these sections of the grid that uh, just have normal letters filled in. Like, I, I would want to see more overlap, more uh, of a complex construction if I were to ever, ever do something like this again. I'm also kind of critical of the flavor text for this puzzle. I don't think the flavor text was ever intended to be final. I think I had intended to come back to it after designing a few more puzzles and uh, seeing how the whole story was going to come together. I think the most important part of uh, hinting Braille is gotten across in this flavor text, but the first sentence in particular, um, introducing the bat, is really uh, superfluous. It doesn't really serve a purpose. The next sentence about the animals uh, swinging around and crashing into each other was meant to just be a light hint that the words are going to overlap once people start solving the Braille, but I really don't think a hint like that is strictly necessary. I feel like most solvers will probably realize that themselves. So I would probably cut maybe like 70 to 80 percent of this flavor text and, and just have maybe a one sentence pretty concise hint for braille and leave it at that. I like that I was able to encode one braille character in each line of the grid, and the length of the answer is what specified the size of the grid. That was um, part of the intention of the construction from the beginning. I think my biggest complaint about the puzzle, though, is that it's very process-heavy. There's not really an aha moment here other than realizing the braille and rotating the grid. One could probably make a case for there being an aha moment of noticing that braille words have these um, easily searchable patterns, especially for the longer words. But I just don't think that's satisfying enough to call it an aha moment all by itself. So while I like this effort as a proof of concept for braille crossword puzzles in general, they actually <laughs> seem to be a lot uh, more interesting than I had initially suspected they might be, I don't think that this is necessarily a very satisfying puzzle hunt style puzzle. Just because it's missing that overall aha moment that I feel like a lot of solvers do this kind of puzzle for. 
Now that's about all that I have to say about this puzzle, but I'm hoping that the discussion can continue down in the comments section below. Feel free to let me know if you tried this puzzle, how it went for you. Were you able to get the answer? Did you get stuck at any particular points? How did the process portion of the puzzle feel to you? Feel free to be as critical as you would like of the puzzle. I love having conversations about what things worked and what things didn't work in puzzles like this. But that's it for me, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and as always, happy escaping.